Glad to be here. Um, but as you can see, the stage looks a little bit different. Uh, so this is for our monumental series. Um, this will coincide with our Kids Jam, uh, which is always a great time, but it'll be coming up in a couple weeks. So if you haven't signed up for that yourself or if you have kids that are interested, we encourage you to do so. But with this series, we're going to be talking about the aspects of God, of his greatness, how amazing he is. Um, but to start off, I want to ask a question to kind of survey the room a little bit. So how many of y'all still use Facebook? Right? Okay. Now, for the younger generation, that may be a foreign concept. Okay. So uh, for my generation growing up, we used Facebook. That was the thing. Before that, it was MySpace, which I never had one of those. But, um, but now the current thing is to have an Instagram or a Snapchat. Those are the, the most popular uh, forms of social media right now. But I had the weirdest thing happen this past week. I had a student send me a friend request on Facebook. I was like, how do y'all even know what that is? Like, I've, I, I'm almost friends with none of my students on Facebook. On Instagram and stuff, that's one thing. But I was like, how in the world? And it was, they just made one. Like, it wasn't like an old account and they just found me. It was like freshly new and it wasn't hacked either. It was just, they were wanting to be on Facebook. I don't know if it was for Facebook Marketplace or what the deal was. But I thought that was just so weird. And so I got to thinking about Facebook, and um, we were talking about this message and stuff. And on Facebook, there's a bunch of different things you can do with your profile. Um, now, you can have your relationship status, okay? Probably if you've been on Facebook, you've changed that a time or two for various reasons. But there's all kinds of interesting things you can label it, right? Now, the, probably the most interesting one is you can put it's complicated, <coughs> Okay, I'm sorry, but if my relationship is a little bit complicated, I don't want anybody to know. Like, <clears throat> I'm not going to put that out there for everybody to see. But you can, okay. But now, we were, we were talking about that, and, you know, love or relationships or that kind of thing, they can be kind of complicated sometimes, can't they? But when we look at the love of God, for example, it's pretty simple, right? You know, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, in theory, it's simple, but in reality, his love for us and his creation is very, very complicated, right? So in something like that, it's something that, that we can take into our own lives, and I'm not telling everybody to change their relationship status to complicated, but just think for a moment, the God, the God of the universe that loves us unconditionally, his love is quite complicated, you know, but how, how do we start to understand love? Now, granted, some of the older generation in here that they, not a knock, but just I'm not married, but y'all have probably been married or in a relationship for a long time and probably can speak about love better than I can, which is totally fine. Um, but how do we begin to understand what love truly is? And well, that comes down to simply coming to the source, right? Well, God is the author of love. He is the very existence of love. If we look at uh, 1 John, starting in chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So this is our first step to understanding the nature of God, His love, and what His love looks like in our lives. Now, I see it time and time again, especially with younger people. Um, I see people posting all over social media, they've been in a new relationship, it may only be a week, or maybe a couple weeks, and like, oh my goodness, I love him, I love her, whatever the, the status may be. But I'm like, no, you don't. You, you don't even know their middle name. Like, how can you say you genuinely love somebody, but, but you know nothing about them? You may know their favorite color and where they like to eat because they take your money. But <clears throat> one of the two things. But see, love, love is very complicated. It's something that, that we have understood it to be something that grows, whether it's in relationships or, or different things, it's something that's, that's gradual. But in fact, God's love is very different. His love has been the same always and forever. His love is unconditional in all times and all places. But see, Paul, when he was writing to the church in Ephesus, he saw this very same issue. He saw this very superficial, surface-level love that the church was, was revolving its faith around and how it was treating others. And he said, you know, there's kind of a problem here. We don't grasp the full nature and the gravity of God and his love. And so he, he points it down and he tries to actually break it down into something that, that is something we're, we're trying to understand his nature. But in reality, God is so immense and grandiose that we will never fully understand the nature in, in God because 
he's just that great and magnificent. But he tries to, as he writes in Ephesians chapter 3, where this is kind of be the, the meat and potatoes of our message this morning of where everything comes from. But it says in chapter or in verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So now, he's writing this as a prayer, he, he's writing it to them saying, guys, you, I, I, my, my prayer and my urge to you is to fully grasp the nature of God because it will reset your mind, it will reset your thinking, and it will set you on the path headed in the right direction. But in verse 18, he says something very uh, specific. And he says, I'm praying that you may have strength to comprehend the love of God. He knows how complicated it is. He's saying you are going to take strength because you trying to figure it out on yourself is going to beat you up a little bit. For us on, on our human level in this world to fully understand a God that exists outside of this world takes so much of us to fully understand. And he, he's giving us a glimpse and a, gl- and a glimmer of how truly amazing he is. But he tries to break it down into four dimensions for us to try to grasp the nature of God. Um, So if you're taking notes this morning, the first point is this, is that the first dimension that Paul is trying to get us to grasp about the nature of God is the breadth of God's love. Now, the breadth, that term, can be interchanged with width, okay? Um, That term means basically to spread over an expanse, a a covering, um, is how this word is used. And he's talking about the protection and the provision of God, God's love extends to us and to all things in this way. David, he writes in Psalms 103, he he writes about this exact kind of love of how it spreads, about how it covers. Um, If we look at verse 11, he says, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. So he's saying that God's love spans as far as the east is from the west. I believe it was uh, Brandon a couple weeks ago, he was talking about this very same passage. And when we look at it, the term, when we look at cardinal directions, right, north, south, east, and west. East and west will go on infinitely. If you continue east in one direction, and it went all the way around the globe, you would continually go east infinitely. And the same with west. If you went west, you would keep going in the direction that you were traveling would never change. But if you go north to south, eventually at a certain point, if you were to travel north on the globe, at a certain point when you cross the other side, you would be going down. You would be going south. So north and south would be limited in that way, but he's saying that from as far as the east is from the west, which is infinite... That is how great God's love is for us that expands and extends over us. Now, um, if any of y'all know me um, and have heard my life in the past recent uh, you know, few months or so, um, I had to get a brand new engine in my car several months ago. Um, thankfully, it was covered under warranty, you know, that kind of thing. But it left me without a car for about three months. Um, I was bouncing between rentals, between the blessings of people allowing me to borrow their vehicles. Um, and it, it was, it, you know, a hard time. I had that car since college. And, uh, but God provided everything in that situation. But I had just got the engine put back in it. And I was driving it. And I had it for maybe about a month. And then the other week, I got into an accident. And I was like, okay, a little bit of a wake-up call here. But I had just put the engine in the car. I thought it was brand, like, all spanking new, was going to be good to go all set and things were going to be looking up and then not even a month later I was driving home late one night on 485 and it was either a truck or a trailer or something we don't know because they they were nowhere to be found after the scene but a strap broke on their their trailer and lumber was all over 485 on both lanes now the incident looked terrible 
Um, it took out two semis, a motorcycle, and I was one of six vehicles. Um, and by the time you're going 75 miles an hour on the interstate, by the time you see it in your headlights, it's too late. Um, it looked like an absolutely terrible situation. And you see the first two, the, the part of this that gets even worse is the first two individuals to hit the debris were the semi and the motorcycle going side by side. Motorcycle hit it, him and his bike were thrown for about 15, 20 feet, and then his bike burst into flames. Now, thankfully, by a miracle of God, he was in full gear and a helmet, and he's okay. He got up, his leg was torn up pretty bad, he had some scuffing on his hands, but it could have been a lot worse. And the, the size of the gash in his helmet was, was insane. But by a miracle, everyone was okay. All the drivers and all the vehicles, th this is even the crazier thing, is not a single car collided with another. Everybody hit the debris and was able to scatter and dodge and hit, miss the whole thing. Which I, I don't know how that happened. But now my car, I mean the whole underside was torn up pretty bad. I couldn't drive it. It had to get towed off the scene. But a situation like that looks terrible. But in reality, I had to just be thankful that God orchestrated it the way that it needed to happen so that everyone was okay. See, God's provision, he doesn't make bad things happen to us. He didn't make that strap break off of that trailer or that truck. But he knew that it was going to happen, and he allowed the whole circumstance to happen in probably the best way that it possibly could have. And it could have been so much worse. See, even in our darkest nights, God will show us glimmers of his amazing grace and his love. You see, his expanse extends forever. And even into that, as we begin to look and, and see more of God's love and how it will take shape, God's love is always there for us if we seek him. But it also, when Paul writes, he says that the second dimension, if you're taking notes this morning, the second dimension of God's love is the length. The length of God's love. This, this length that he refers to, that he writes about, does not simply refer to, to length in, in measurement, but this term length refers to time and a concept of time. Saying that God's love transcends time, both past, present, and future. That it's always there. So it's all-encompassing, but then it, it always was and always will be. So we, we start to begin to see this fuller picture, but, but when we can kind of grasp a sense of God and how he works on time, it's a lot different than how we do. In Second Peter, he writes, starting in chapter 3, it says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Many times we're waiting on God to do something in our life, but in reality it's on his time, it's not on ours. His timing is always perfect, even if to us it seems either the wrong time or it feels like it's taking forever. But when we look at this, and I look at this situation, God knew that that was going to happen. So he orchestrated every vehicle in that scenario to hit it at the precise time it needed to that everyone would come out okay. If you know the car that I drive, that I, I don't have it right now, but that I typically drive, it's a small Hyundai Veloster, very small sports car, super small. If I would have been one of the first people to hit that lumber when it was still fully intact, I don't know what would have happened. My car would have probably flipped, um, and I, I genuinely don't know what would have happened. But God allowed, in front of me, during the night, there were two semis, and they were both in, they were in both lanes. They were not just on one. If, if they both were in one lane, I would have still hit full debris. But because they were in both lanes, they broke it up enough that by the time I hit it, I was okay. And I have to look at that and say, you know, that, that biker could have been me thrown from the vehicle. But granted, by the grace of God, he's okay, everyone is okay. And then we even look at the other circumstances in that scenario, how grave it may look. When his bike burst into flames, there was one of the drivers 
had a fire extinguisher in his, in his car, was able to put out the fire before the cops got there. And I don't know the relationship of anyone who was there. I heard cursing like sailors and all kinds of things in the scene. But miraculously, nobody was mad at anybody. Because whoever lost the lumber wasn't there. There was no one to be mad at. The only thing everyone cared about was, was that one, was everyone okay? And everybody was checking on the biker. Which you don't see that anymore. People are just concerned with their things and their own problems and, and how it affects them. And then not only that, you know, it doesn't have to be me, it can be anybody. But God allowed me to be there that night to be a representative of Christ, to pray over those men and women that were there. Allowed me to have a story to share with you today. Allowed me to be a witness to them. And maybe to that biker, maybe that was his wake-up call that he needed. And he goes, man, like, this looks really bad. Like, God, why, why would you let this happen to me? But then maybe he sent me to be there, standing with him, praying with him, saying, okay, this looks bad, but God was still there. Somebody was there praying for me, loving on me. And then even on top of all of that, my car had to be towed off the scene, and it was late at night. Nobody was awake. <laughs> there was nobody to call. And I asked the officer, I said, sir, I said, my car's got to be towed. And they helped me get the tow truck, by the way, which was super nice. Um, and they, I said, is there any way I can get a ride home? <laughs> and he said, you know, actually, we're headed in that direction. So it wasn't even an inconvenience for the officer to take me home. And then now, all of y'all have a story to tell that your youth pastor rode in the back of a cop car. <laughs> but... <clears throat> But see, every story, there's always light in it. It doesn't matter how dark it is. But we need to see it through God's eyes. See it through his protection and see it through his timeline. See where all the pieces line up. See all the grace and the love that he's extended in every ounce of it. It doesn't matter how dark it is. He is always there. See, as, as Paul continues to write, he mentions these two dimensions. And he says, his love doesn't stop there. Doesn't stop covering all things. Doesn't stop even in time itself. He says, but I'm going to add the third dimension. He says, I'm going to add the height. The third dimension is the height of God's love. Now this term means a couple different things when we, when we talk about height. One, this height is referring to the grandiose and the immensity and the glory and the magnificence of God how big he truly is. But two, because of the height, it is also referring the difference between heaven and earth. He's talking about how that gap was transcended from him to come down to earth, to be his man, to die for our sins, to be like us, to save us. See, Timothy, he writes and he puts it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 1. It says, in which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He's saying here that this, he abolished death. This, this immense occasion that he did. This act that he did for us has now left an ultimate landmark in the timeline of life and in humanity and is something that no man could ever do that will be greater than that moment. He says, in this moment in time, I will leave the biggest mark in history, on humanity, that no man can surpass to show greater love than I. And we look at the height and the magnitude of God. He didn't have to do that. He left the perfectness of heaven, his residence, to come be ridiculed and mocked and scorned by us. And we say, well, why would he do that? Especially because if he can see through time and space, he knows every time we would turn our back on him. Every time we would sin. Every time we would neglect him. Every time we would drift away. But again, his love works different. 
He saw all of that and said, I'm still going to die for you. I still love you. My love will always be bigger than the love of man. To put kind of in perspective of how big God really is, let's, let's talk about space. Are there any you know, science buffs in here? No? Okay, that's cool. I'm not either. But I did a little bit of research. Okay? Now, what about, does anybody like camping? I don't like camping. But that's okay. Um, but when you're out there and you're away from society and lights and stuff, what do you see? You look up in the sky and you see all the stars. You see the planets. You see this magnificent picture of beauty and everything that God has created. And it's way bigger than our planet. But when you, I did a little research. So we have our, our galaxy, or our solar system, right? We have our nine planets, now eight because we kicked Pluto out. But we have our solar system, right? And planets are pretty big, and our solar system's pretty big, right? Especially compared to us. We're like particles in comparison. But I got to thinking, I was like, okay, so you have the solar system, and then we have our galaxy, the Milky Way. And I didn't realize this. The Milky Way galaxy, just our galaxy, has estimated, now granted they can't individually count everyone, they would lose track and have to fire somebody every day, but there's estimated to be a hundred, not million, billion planets just in the Milky Way galaxy. And then that's not even on top of how many billions and billions of galaxies there are in the universe. But yet our God is the creator of all of it who holds it all within his hands, who sculpted it, who fashioned it. And even despite all of that, the immensity of that, he said, I'm going to pick this tiny little speck called Earth in all of that. And I'm going to choose to create these messed up people that I love. I'm going to put them here. And I'm going to give them the full amount of my love. He didn't spare an ounce. He came to die for us. Out of all of the, the amazingness and the magnificence of God and his glory, he said, I'm going to pick this little tiny speck and I'm going to die for humanity. And he looked to each and every one of us and said, I love you individually and I want to have a relationship with each and every one of you. And to put a greater, in, let, let's try to even simplify that for a moment. When we look at love, many times we think of family. And we have this image of God. God is our father. It doesn't matter what your life or what you've been through. God is your father forever and always. But if you have a little kid and you have his, his father standing there, he, he may go, you know, Dad, I love you this much. And he can only extend his arms to his wingspan. But he is a child. And we will always be God's children. We will never be an adult to God. We will always be his children and he will always be bigger than us. And because of that, when he stands there as a, as a kid, the dad will go, but son, I love you this much. And his span will be bigger than yours and yours will ever be. God's love will always be bigger than the love that you can give and will always be bigger than the love that you can comprehend. And that's, you, you can't even comprehend that. You think you can just love on forever. But God's love is truly infinite and bigger than anything we can imagine. God's love is always, always there. And see, Paul knew that there still, even on top of all of this that we've learned and talked about, there has to be more. It can't just be this. See, I have this box here. Forgive me, it's Christmas. It's the only box I had. But this box, right, how do you get the dimensions of a box? Length times width times height. I know I did that all wrong. But length times width times height, okay? That's how you get the dimensions of this box. That is how we view God and his love, is we put him in a box, known by only those three dimensions. We stuff him in here when, in fact, he cannot be contained. That is how we view him. But Paul knew 
that you can't just stuff him in a box. Now, he wasn't, you know, he was a very, very smart man, but he was not some, you know, mathematician or, or anything like that. But he still knew that there had to be one more thing because God is not simple. God's love is not that simple. It's, in fact, so complicated. See, we have to add a fourth dimension. When he saw that, he writes this, and he says, the fourth dimension is the depth of God's love. And in fact, this is the most important of the dimensions of God's love. His depth is how we have a relationship with him. It's something that transcends a box, that is something tangible, is something that we can see with the mere mortal eye. Have you ever tried to understand the concept of like what a fourth dimension would look like? Like, if you take this box, and so this has three dimensions, it's a three-dimensional object, where would you add a fourth dimension? What, what transcends a, a thing? Even if you continue one of the dimensions in another direction, it just gets bigger. It doesn't actually add another dimension or another level to the item. See, I'm not a scientist, but the easiest way I can try to understand it is if you have, let, let's, let's break it down to two dimensions real quick, okay? So I have this note card, right? This is a two-dimensional object. Now, for a true two-dimensional object, there would be no back and there would be absolutely no thickness to this card. So just bear with me, pretend this is completely flat and you're looking at it like this, okay? This flat object, if it were to come into contact with another index card, another thing that is just as flat as it is, that's all it could see, is if it were butting up to each other. There's no height. There's nothing it can see beyond the plane that it exists on. But say this two-dimensional object comes into contact with a three-dimensional object. It can only see the plane that it exists on. So it has no concept that there is height to this box because it can only see the sliver that the plane exists on. I, I see some gears turning. Bear with me but it, it does get a little bit complicated. But now, by the concept of three dimensions versus two dimensions, us, as three-dimensional beings, we can look at this two-dimensional object and we can see all of it at one time in a single space. Now again, you see all sides and you even see the center, which again, this is completely flat, so the center is there. You see all sides and you see the center. You see all of it in a single moment in time. But as a three-dimensional object, if I look at this box and I look at each and every one of you, I cannot see behind you. I cannot see the back side of this box because I'm only limited by the dimension that I exist in, the, the dimension that I see through, the dimension that I know. So by that same law, the three-dimensional object can see all of a two-dimensional object. But for four dimensions to exist, a four-dimensional being or thing would be able to see all of a three-dimensional object at once, including the inner workings. So how God sees us, now granted, I'm not labeling God as a four-dimensional being. That is too simple for God, okay? He is way beyond that. But what I'm saying is, is he can see all of us at one time. He can see everywhere that we're going. He can see us from top to bottom, from side to side, and he sees everything on the inner workings of you because he created it. He sees your health, he sees your thoughts, he sees your life. That fourth dimension skews things so much more than we think it does. And it kind of expands our mind a little bit to think beyond that. And I hope you all are still tracking with me. But see, for that fourth dimension, for something to be added to the love of God, something to be added into our life for us to experience it, it has to be something on the inside. And it has to be something that cannot be seen. Because just in the same way, we cannot see that fourth dimension, but it exists. God's love exists in all four of these. In depth, in faith, is the faith in the things unseen.
If we look at Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. That is how our faith needs to look today. Are you living in that fullness of God's love? Are you only living in certain dimensions of it? Do you only believe in certain aspects of God? Do you have a pick and choose kind of faith? Because whether we choose to love him fully or not, he exists and loves fully. There's nothing that will change that. Many of us are living our faith in three dimensions are living our lives in three dimensions by something that we can measure. Something by length times width and times height. We know and we have the knowledge of God. We read our Bible. We know that God loves us. But have you grasped it? Is there any depth to it? See, just like when we talked before about what many people think love is, we get it from movies We get it from things we shouldn't be watching. We get it from dreams and and Disney. Instead of the reality of the truth of what God, of love really is from the source. And we have a superficial, shallow level vision of God and of our faith. Our love has to. And our faith has to exist in four dimensions. Because if there is no depth, if God is not indwelling in us through the Holy Spirit, that's no faith at all. There's no relationship with God. Just because we come to church, just because we read our Bible, just because we have Christian friends, just because I, have, I love Jesus in my bio, none of those things mean that you have a genuine relationship with Christ. Because to have a genuine relationship with Christ is to live in that fullness. To live in the completeness of God's love. Not just the portion of it. Now granted, you will still not fully understand. I don't fully understand. Nobody fully understands God's love except God. But we have to understand it from our perspective. But he's allowed us to see that glimpse. The glimpse that matters. The glimpse that we need to know. He has transcended space and time itself to love us. But yet sometimes we can't even love our neighbor. That love has to be evident in all of our lives. We will be known by our fruits. If we know that kind of love, there's no excuse for us to not be showing that kind of love. And we make excuses for it all the time. We blame it on life, or we blame it on circumstances, or we blame it on this, this, and this. When in fact those circumstances may be exactly God's will for your life to show you something greater. He sees what's on the other side. And sometimes the grass isn't always greener. But I can promise it's better because it has Jesus. That's my challenge for each of us today. Is what does your faith look like? Is it shallow? Is there any weight to it? Or is it just a checkbox? Is it just a relationship status, something that you wear, something that you hold? Or is it something that is tangible, something that can be grasped? See, Paul, he writes, when he's talking about this term depth, he uses the word vathos. That term means deep, as in deep sea, deep ocean. Now, granted, he, they didn't have the technology quite like we do today, and we know that the deepest point on earth, especially in the ocean, is Mariana's Trench. And we still know nothing about that place. But to them, for the relatively primitive era, they thought that every lake and ocean was pretty much bottomless. They had no concept of how really deep it was. So even that term extends to how deep his love extends into you. The true depth of how much his love extends into your heart, into your life, and how it can change you. What does your faith look like today? And do you truly know all dimensions of God's love? Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this day. 
Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to be here. But Lord, I pray that we challenge all of ourselves, that we would be challenged to know what kind of faith that we have. If we have a faith like that Paul wrote about, one that encompasses all the dimensions of you, that we don't just pick and choose where we live in and where we reside in your faith and in your existence, but Lord, we trust you. And Lord, that we have a relationship with you. And Lord, if maybe that's us today, maybe we haven't, Maybe there's no weight to our faith. Maybe it's just a religion. Maybe it's just we're here at church on a whim. Lord, I pray that that they would pray to you. It's not some special prayer. It's not some ritual. But it's simply just saying, God, I need you. God, I love you because you first loved me. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that your love transcends all things. Lord, please come into my life and change me so that I can experience the love and the peace that your love brings. If that's you today, I would ask you to put that on the connection cards in front of you and and we would love to come alongside you in your next steps and your walk in faith. But for the rest of us, say we do know Jesus. We have a relationship with him. Maybe we haven't taken it to the next level. Maybe we've been living it shallowly when we know that there's so much more to you, to you and your, your magnificent nature. Lord, there's so much for us to grasp, and we, we only have a glimpse of it. Lord, I pray that you would challenge us to see where our lives are at. If we're living in the fullness of you, or we're living a superficial life. Lord, I pray all this in your holy name, pray and ask it. Amen. See you all next week.